afternoon everybody. This week we have yet another astrophysics related colloquium or although this would be more cosmology not uh, not so deep into astrophysics as last week. So it is it is uh, my pleasure to to introduce to you today Jorge Enrique Garcia Farieta who has joined our institute quite recently after uh, some perturbations related to COVID, so he was supposed to join us much earlier uh, this year, but there were some issues with visa, he had to go to Colombia, then he got locked in there and things like that. So, so in fact, he's been working with us for quite a while, but formally he's our employee since very recently as a postdoc in our computational cosmology group. Uh, so Jorge did his PhD in Bologna, he finished last year, University of Bologna in Italy. And earlier he uh, got his master's in his home country at the University of Columbia, which I believe is in Bogota, in the capital. And he today will be speaking about his main topic of research uh, and of interest, which are so-called redshift space distortions and how they can be used for constraints on cosmological models. So uh, please, Jorge, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to, pre to present the, the colloquium to, today. I'm very happy for, for this opportunity and thank you everybody for being here. So in the next few minutes, I, I will talk about redshift space distortions as a cosmological proof and how can we use this uh, technique to, to set some constraints on cosmological models uh, beyond the standard model, beyond the lambda CDM model. And this is the auto line that uh, I will try to, to follow. And uh, let's start. First of all, I, let's put in context the, the cosmological stuff. So the, the current cosmologic, standard cosmological model that we have is based at least on five pillars, two theoretical and three observational. From the theoretical part, we have the general relativity as a theory of gravity and also the cosmological principle. And on the other hand, from the observational point of view, we have the cosmic microwave background, CMB. We have also the structure formations and the uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Putting all of this together, we, have, uh, we can describe the evolution of the universe as a fluid with uh, several components. Uh, using the Prickman equation that we have in the upper right part. Uh, some of the constraints of the main parameters that, uh, that describe this standard model are in this table using, for example, the, the I, um, I report here the parameters from Planck 2018 where we have uh, W, that is the parameter related uh, to the equation of state for, called dark for cosmological constant. We have also here the, the Hubble parameter, the, the a dimensional density parameter, omega matter, omega for curvature, omega for cosmological constant, and one parameter related to the growth of structures. So, here we can see what the evolution of these parameters in, in time. So we are using this quantity to, that it's the so-called redshift that is related to uh, the, the cosmic time. And we can see the evolution for the different components that we have. Matter, that is a, a both cold dark matter and also baryonic matter, the purple line, radiation that includes uh, the neutrinos component and also the the cosmological constant the blue the blue line and what is important here is to to see that the intersection between lines uh, split the cosmic history in at least uh, three different epochs or eras the dark uh, well starting from the radiation era that is more related to the primordial universe, then passing to the matter domain. And finally, we have the dark energy era, actually at um, redshift equal zero, that is the, well, our moment, we have the, the values uh, that we can see in, in, in this table. Yeah? The, 
the purple line, it has um, at this uh, present time the value of 0.3. The blue line, the dark energy, is about 0.7, and the radiation is almost zero. So that's why we say that we are in this moment, according to the standard model, living in the dark energy era. One of the most important points from uh, this model is to explain how the uh, structures evolve. How can we pass from a picture like this, from the cosmic microwave background, where we have a very small, very tiny difference in the densities, it means from one red point to a blue one, we have a difference of 10 to the minus six orders. How can we, can we pass to something in the density field where the difference are on the order of hundreds? Well, uh, to explain that, we have to introduce a, a concept that is the density contrast. It's, it is the, the difference between the density, the variations in the density density field over the average density. And with that, we can characterize how the structures grow according to this uh, fluid uh, model that we have. We can use uh, a little bit of thermodynamics, uh, Euler equations, and get um, an equation to describe how the tiny perturbation from the early universe can grow to form the virializer the structures that we can detect uh, today. In this, in this plot, we have um, what is the, um, the behavior of the density, of the density field for each one of the components that uh, we have in, in the model, for the baryons, for cold dark matter, and also for, for radiation. And we can see that all radiation uh, is not contributing too, too much to create structures, variants, um, the blue line, they are following the, the pattern of the cold dark matter. And this is very important because we can create, a, we can form virialized uh, structures only when we include uh, the, the cold dark matter. Without cold dark matter, well, it was a problem during several years. And the solution is to include cold dark matter to create virialized structures. And from the observational point of view, well, this quantity that the measure that is related to the growth of structures, we can express in terms of this uh, D function, the linear growth function that is related to observations. And what we have in this plot it's the, the prediction for different cosmological parameters using the same model, the same standard model, same assumption, but we have here different parameters, different values for omega matter, different values for omega lambda, curvature, etc. And we have here the cosmology for Planck, for W map, for Wiggle Zeta, and also for a simulation, the, sim the millennium simulation. And we can see that. Uh, the prediction, if we change the parameter, well, then we are getting also a, a different prediction, even if it's the, the same model. So something that we are interested in is to set constraints on those cosmological parameters, because we can constrain both the cosmological parameters, but also the cosmological model. And in this sense is that this parameter, the growth, the growth factor, it, it's a, a very important. This parameter can help us to, to constrain both the cosmological model and also the gravity theory. Remember that one of the main assumptions that we have for the standard model is the general relativity as a theory of gravity. So in this plot, we have um, some uh, the comparison between some measurements from several projects, from several redshift surveys like the CDQ field, the slow and digital sky survey, gamma, we call CETA, and VIPERS, and also the prediction for the standard model using the parameters from, from Planck. That is the table that I show you before. Let me introduce some aspects, like how can we get those parameters? So let me introduce a, a couple of concepts that we will go uh, a little bit deeper in this because it's actually is the, the main topic to, to use, um, the main concept to use redshift space distortion. So 
we are measuring the density field, actually measuring the variations between different points on the density field. And we can quantify those measurements using the, is the correlation function or its equivalent in Fourier space, that is the so-called power spectrum. Well, measuring, measuring those correlations, uh, we can set the constraint of the, on the cosmology. And something important also to mention is that since in this model, the structures are formed following the, the dark matter, we have a term here that is the, a bias term that relates the cosmic, the density field of the tracers. I mean, the cosmic tracers that we observe in, 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 in real life, like a galaxies, quasars, etc. And the relation with the dark matter density field that in the most simple scenario, uh, we can model that uh, using a, a linear bias relation. Well, as um, we mentioned, measuring, measuring the, the density field, the statistics from the density field, we can set constraints on cosmology. Actually, here we have in this uh, plot, well, the, how the, the power spectrum changes when we change the different parameters. And that's why we, we have here some, well, these bars that we can move to see how the parameter is, how the, the power spectrum is, is changing. As conclusion in, at the, in this stage, we have that the power, the power spectrum or the equivalent, the correlation function, encode a lot, a lot of information, physical information from several stages. We have information from something that is called baryonic acoustic oscillations. We can also involve the, the effect of neutrino mass, the fluctuation from primordial power in the spectrum. And as we will see in few slides, also the redshift space distortions that are related to the constraint on this growth factor that I will focus more in this, in this aspect. So um, the standard, the, despite the success of the standard model, the Lambda CDN model to explain several features, several observations using only six parameters, there are still many open questions, fundamental questions from both the observational and the theoretical point of view, like uh, the fine tuning, the coincidence uh, problem, the nature, what's the nature of the cosmological constant, the nature of dark energy, dark matter, and from the observational point of view, the satellite abundance, the uh, abundance of voids, angular momentum, etc. And recently, we have uh, two big uh, tensions. I don't, I don't want to, to use the, the word problem, let's say uh, tensions, that they are related to two main parameters from the model. That is the tension in the Hubble parameter and the tension in the sigma parameter. That is, you remember, the sigma parameter is related to how the structures grow. Um, well, the tensions consist in that uh, we are actually getting different values when we apply different observational, different um, cosmological proof. For the Hubble tension, the value that we are getting uh, outside the two sigma confident levels is different when we use uh, information from CMB than when we use uh, supernova data. You see that here we have two very well constrained values, but uh, they are also quite different. And something similar is happening with the sigma, with the sigma the value. The value that we are getting from CMB, it's quite different at two sigma uh, level when we use uh, galaxy clusters. So this has motivated uh, the modified uh, scenarios. Probably there are some systematics to consider here to solve those tensions because, well, uh, there is only one parameter, so it should have only one value. And 
This has motivated two things, or we are not considering some systematics in how are we constraining those parameters, or could be that there is something new in, in physics uh, that can, can help us to solve the tensions. And in the sense of modified gravity, it is worth to remember that the standard cosmological model, the lambda CDN model, is pure phen phenomenological model, and we don't know still uh, how to explain cosmic acceleration from first principle. Again, what's the, the content of the universe? Because the uh, cosmological constant means more than 70, 75% of the content of the universe and also to solve the astrophysical problem. So we have the scenario of modified gravity that in this map we can see several branches depending of uh, what the, the modification. We can break some assumption of, of, the, of, this, uh, of general relativity or to extend the, the theory, whether breaking the assumption addition, uh, uh, or to, to add some scalar fields or to add another substance like a massive, uh, massive gravity. And uh, something uh, that is also important is that appear in this modified gravity model, in some of the modified gravity models, is the screening mechanisms of, the, of some models. The screening, the screening mechanisms means that we have some models that they can accelerate the universe without involving a cosmological constant. It means that they, 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 they have the, the same or at least a similar history expansion of the lambda CDM, but they produce a different growth of the structures. It means they, they can mimic lambda CDM in some aspects, but actually they, are, uh, they have uh, a different uh, Gravitational Did you ask theory. the question during the seminar, or this is already forbidden? Yes, you can ask. Yes, of course. Well, I was trying to do this at the very beginning when the. Uh, well, the, my next question is: I mean, there are so many beautiful pictures uh, uh, about these extensions of or modification. Well, they disappear of the gravity and. Uh, is, is this what you are talking about, the only necessity of introducing those modifications? Or are those modifications predicting any other physical phenomena happening in the universe? Well, that, that's a, a, a very interesting question. And, um, uh, well, the, depending on the, the assumption of the gravity, they can predict uh, uh, different different phenomena at this stage um, since I'm focusing only in the in the part of the, the yeah, but, but when we are talking about the extension of a certain theory we have to check whether this extension are not violating any other results which we have very well established for example I don't know whether this is applicable but would that if we use one of those other colors on your picture, would the uh, precession of a mercury orbit or uh, change or not in those other theories? Or yes, in, indeed, that um, there are several proof to to see if well, we know that the standard model uh, well is phenomenological and it, it agrees with many results. Uh, and what, the, what do you mean? There's a, what do you mean that the standard gravitation theory is phenomenological? Oh, that um, we don't have uh, um, from first principles. We, uh, there, there is not. Um, I believe the general piece. theory is a first principle theory. Yes, yes, but not a cosmological then, constant. Uh, are, you, are you telling me that there should be any other? theory out of which we could have derived a general relativity? No, but what we don't know if is general relativity is working at cosmological scales. The, the test that we have for general relativity, all of them, as, as far as I know, they are uh, as big for solar system scales. We don't know if uh, at cosmological scales the same... Uh, that is precisely what I'm asking you. 
we, I'm perfectly okay with the possibility of generalization or extension of general theory of relativity. But the question is, are those extensions in agreement with what we know already well, with, with well-established experimental facts in our solar system? Yes, or yes, they are not I'm, applicable. I'm, Yes, I'm going in, in that in that in that direction. So, uh, right. there, there are uh, no further questions. Thank you. Uh, I'm going in, in that direction, and actually, yes, many of the modification of gravity. Uh, this is only a, a, a simplified map, but many of the modifications they are already ruled out because they cannot predict, for example, uh, solar system solar system tests. So many of the models, they are already out, but still there are many other modification of gravity that they can predict the same or at least similar results. And that's why, uh, from my point of view, uh, redshift spaces distortions are, are important because, and we will see, we can use the redshift space distortions to distinguish between those models and to see if they, are, if they can predict the, the clustering that we observe. Okay. Okay. So, uh, indeed, in redshift space to 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 enter already in redshift space distortions, uh, it can be useful to distinguish between those modified gravity models that well the, we have this uh, giant map, or to distinguish if we uh, if our model of the universe can be understood with uh, the dark energy. Uh, substance. Actually, I was surprised when I found this this picture that there are already some companies selling dark energy drinks. Okay, uh, so for redshift space distortions, uh, uh, we can we need to talk also about the uh, current uh, status of the observation and also from the embodied simulations that they can help us to to understand the model. So from the point of the observation from the redshift surveys, uh, we have uh, hundreds of saucers from optical photons from distant galaxies we can detect it with a high efficiency. And with this information, we can create three-dimensional maps to characterize the, the density field. And in the plots, in the plots that we have here, we see the some of the previous and uh, current gal galaxy surveys in both optical and radio and uh, how they they what's the relation between the effective volume and the number of galaxies and if we see here well in in this uh, decade we have at least uh, two or three big uh, projects euclid and desi for the optical part and also the ska ska for the radio observations that they will perform for sure amazing, uh, they will map the universe as, as never before. Okay, from the point of view of the numerical simulations, here we have uh, an historical plot from what we can consider uh, what is the first analogical simulation performed in the 40s by Holmberg in, in Netherlands. It's, it's analogical because of what Holmberg Homberg uh, did is to, to set on a table in, in a laboratory to set an arrangement of light bulbs. And well, the arrangement was following the, at least in a qualitative point, uh, the description of galaxies and measuring the light intensity, since the light intensity decays also as one over R squared. Well, he, he did some analysis in analogous to the a gravitational force. But today we have something uh, like uh, this plot uh, from numerical dark matter uh, simulations. And what is important here is how can we pass from those simulations to something that we can observe. And what we can observe, I mean that we need to construct mock catalogs. It means to, to include uh, many effects, not only the peculiar, the peculiar velocities that the 
we will see, but also astrophysical effects, systematics effects. And uh, one of the, the important part is the peculiar velocity. So we can imagine here, well, a um, fish, a bank fish, uh, where we have two components, the, the flow of the, of the river, but also the every single velocity of every fish. So if we understand this in a cosmological constant, we, we don't have any more fish, but we have uh, cosmic tracers that they can be galaxies or they can, they can be galaxies or another astrophysical ob object. And what is replacing the, the flow of, of the river is the Hubble flow. And the peculiar velocity, the sorry, the motion of the fish now is the peculiar velocity of galaxies. So in this plot, if we consider only the Hubble flow, this is the distribution that we are getting. But when we consider the peculiar velocities, uh, the distribution in the density field is, is distorted. So there is a contribution of the peculiar velocities that we want to analyze, and that's what we call the red chip space distortions. Well, we have to, to consider the, how the, the velocities affect the distribution, and we can characterize at least this in two regimes. In the linear regime, with, we, have, we are talking about large scales, um, in the non-linear regime, I mean uh, smaller, smaller scales. In the linear, in the linear regime, uh, there is um, the the effect of these velocities is um, there is this uh, flattening in the pattern in the distribution in the density field. We will see this pattern. This pattern is appearing actually in the correlation function or in the power spectrum in both. And in the nonlinear regime, that is a small scales, well, the velocities, they, they, they are more significant. And it means that we have um, this kind of, um, this kind of, of distortion al uh, along the, the line of sight. That this kind of distortion, uh, well, we, we call fingers of God. Yeah. It means that the observed redshift is a combination of at least two redshifts. One that is the, the cosmological one, the one that is from the Hubble flow, and the one that is coming from the peculiar velocities. And we want to use uh, this, the distorted distribution, to, to set some constraint on the cosmological model. And to do that, uh, well, we are using, we need to use one estimator to find the correlation function. This is one of the estimators that we are, we, that uh, we use in, in cosmology to measure the correlation function. Actually, here is the result of the three-dimensional three-dimensional three correlation function where we see both distortions. The one that is um, small scales, the fingers of God, when there is this distortion, and the one that is a large scales, the, the flattening a large scales, that is the Kaiser effect. So we see uh, those distortion, and we need to, to use a model to set the cosmology, to, to extract cosmological information from there. Uh, from this uh, three-dimensional correlation function, uh, we can analyze the individual contributions, the individual uh, components, I mean the uh, multiple uh, components. We can split this correlation function in its components. If we imagine this correlation function uh, form it uh, compounded by several multiples moments. We have something of this, this style, monopole moment, quadrupole moment, and hexadecapole moment. Just to have a geometrical idea of what they are representing. And I will skip this part. And 
how to model the correlation function? Well, to model the correlation function, we need to use one of the, um, uh, we need uh, an approach to express how the peculiar velocities are, are behaving. And there are several approaches. One, like the one proposed by Kaiser, dispersion model, and there are other models that include uh, more, more terms from the perturbation theory, but I will not enter in, in, in those details. What is important is to remember again that setting from the shape of the correlation function or the power spectrum, we can get we can get those parameters. And to get the parameters, we need to use one of the one of the of the models. Yeah. So let me give just a, an example how to set the constraints on one specific model, the f of r model, the f of r um, uh, gravity, including massive neutrinos. The f of r model is a very particular model from the modified uh, map that I showed before. So it consists in a modification of the Einstein-Hilbert action, including this, uh, this scalar function here. This, um, the particular model that we are using is called Husavisky that this model uh, follow the same history that lambda cdm but at the same time it it has the is in agreement with constraints at solar system scales um, that's why this model is uh, quite popular in in the market and also we are including a massive neutrinos since the 2000 we know that mass the neutrinos they they have a mass so they can affect also the the distribution in the density field so they can uh, produce a suppression a suppression in the in the clustering and that's what we need to to analyze we don't know what's the mass of neutrinos but we can use also redshift space distortion to set uh, some constraints on the neutrino mass well, for this analysis, I use some simulations. And in short, this is what we are performing. We have our distribution in, re in real space from the simulations. Then we consider the peculiar velocities that is creating the, distor the distortion patterns that they are equivalent or they should be equivalent to something that we observe in real life. And then we measure the correlation function, and after that we can model the, correl the shape of the correlation, the correlation function using one of the models to explain the behavior of the peculiar velocity. And from this modeling, we can set the constraint of the individual parameters. We can set constraints about the Hubble parameter, about the growth rate, about the neutrino mass. And I will skip this part. Here is the, the result, for example, for the F of R model when we have um, neutrinos and without neutrinos. For example, in this part, we can see that the, the black line is the standard model, the lambda CDM. When we have the modification in gravity, there is a clustering suppression. You see the, the pattern below the black line. And if we include neutrinos in that modified gravity, there is not a clustering suppression. Actually, the clustering is uh, growing a little bit. This is happening for F of R fold, but we analyze also uh, different values for this F of R. We have uh, also F of R five, six, and different values for the neutrino mass. This is the shape that we get only from the measurements of the correlation function, uh, no anymore in the three-dimensional. Three Here we analyze only the uh, individual multiple moments, the monopole one and the quadrupole one, and how the clustering is behaving. So this part corresponds to the um, to the measurement part. And one of the first estimators to get the uh, uh, the growth rate is uh, this one using the linear theory, comparing the measurements in the distorted case 
with the no distorted case. This is leading to, to this equation that uh, involve the, this, the growth rate. Actually, in this beta parameter, is in code the, the growth rate. That is the one that we are interested in. But we see that uh, since this is coming from linear theory, there are some important and significant deviations at a small scales. So we need to perform a better analysis at the small scales. And that's why we, we need um, modeling of the redshift space distortions. Uh, we can talk about this, uh, this simple model, the dispersion model, to measure the power spectrum, the distorted power spectrum. It means the power spectrum in redshift space compare it to the one that we have in, in real space using, well, this approach that this term is the Kaiser term. There is here an approach to model the behavior of the peculiar velocities. And well, from a Bayesian analysis, we can get the constraint of, of some parameters like the F sigma eight value. Well, I will skip some some uh, some slides, but here we, we have a um, main result of this analysis for the individual uh, models. We can see that from red chip space distortions, we can um, see the deviations from modified gravity versus lambda CDM. And that's why red chip space distortions are, are important because we can uh, decide how far or how in agreement they can be with the observations. Uh, finally, and just to, to conclude, I, I want to just to show shortly uh, the validation of those uh, some estimators for the, for the modeling. And I don't know if there are, probably there are some questions at this stage. Well, uh, so in order to improve the, the modeling, we are considering a more sophisticated model, modeling of the power spectrum, including uh, perturbation theory to understand the nonlinear part, that is the more problematic one. And we can do that using the multiple moments that I mentioned before, but also something that is called the clustering wedges that is a projection in angular scales. We also can include in those mock calculus uh, the effect of instrumental uh, measurements, like uh, the, no, the noise from, from, the, from the instruments. Um, uh, the noise of the, of the instrument, it also uh, means um, an additional term here in the observed redshift, not only the cosmological part, the velocity, the peculiar, the peculiar motion, but also this, this part that is related to instrumental noise for the future and the current galaxy surveys. So including this, this term from instrumental noise, we can get the different patterns. Probably you can see here a small difference between diff the different panels, uh, including the well, different amounts of that instrumental noise. And indeed, if we measure the correlation function, taking, in, 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 taking into account uh, those, those uh, instrumental, that instrumental noise, we see that the, the pattern is also changing. So we need also robust uh, modeling to discriminate the physical part with the instrumental one. Um, here are some results that I will not enter in, in so much uh, details, but uh, um, we repeat the, the same analysis using those estimators. And what is important here is that we can see what is the evolution in terms of redshift of this growth factor. So it means that for every point that we see in this plot, in the, this plot is the, how is changing the growth rate as a function of the redshift for different modeling. 
we have that every point is a cosmological simulation. Every, every point means a cosmological box. So we need to repeat the analysis to see what's the, the cosmic history. And this is doing performing the Bayesian analysis for a specific model. Well, in, in summary, on the message that I, I want to, to give you is that the shape of the correlation function of the, or the power spectrum can tell you a lot about the, the universe, about neutrino properties, also about inflation, dark energy. We can distinguish modified gravity model from a standard model. There is a, a promise, promising future for galaxy surveys like a Euclid that will uh, give us more information to test dark energy and modify gravity. And uh, in this sense, the, we need also to improve the techniques to set, uh, to test um, the gravity theory at cosmological scales. In this sense, redshift space distortions are uh, an old, but at the same time, a powerful tool to understand the the nature of cosmic accelerations. Um, there is a lot of po progress going on regarding the, the modeling, and especially in, in the era of data that we are living. So I want to conclude here and just to say that we are living in an exciting times now. And thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much for her and thanks for keeping uh, well within the time. See you next week.